Redeeming Heart series number five, and I thought about just looking at the series title, uh, God is redeeming your heart. Uh, you know what that means? That means He is freeing your heart. Freeing from what? And I, I want to just remind you, freeing from your slavery of sin. Okay? He loves you, and He is freeing you from slavery of sin. Okay? And can I just ask you, how many of you say uh, with grateful heart that God is redeeming my heart? Can you say amen? amen. With the gratefulness, can you say amen? amen? And the rest of you? It is, you know, that's what Christianity is about. You're becoming uh, free and becoming more like Christ, which means God himself uh, and live like, live like a human being, okay? And that's Christianity, okay? That's Christianity. And I hope you don't, you don't forget this. He loves you. That's why He bought you on Calvary, and He's redeeming you. And I hope that's what's happening in your life. And I do believe that's what's happening in this church, His church, okay? Today I want to talk about grumbling heart. And you may be thinking, <laughs> Why we have to deal with such, you know, uh, dark topics all the time. I'm not going to, I have a few more, and then I'm going to talk, start talking about uh, more positive topics like repentance. I don't know whether you see repentance as a positive thing. A lot of people think repentance is such a negative thing. It is a positive thing because repentance is the only way you will find life in God. Okay? But today I want to talk about grumbling heart. Okay, or murmuring heart, that's a biblical word. Or complaining is probably uh, the most contemporary words that we use all the time. Okay, do you have a grateful heart or do you have a grumbling heart? In general, you think. Okay, let's say you get up in the morning and till, till you go to bed at night. Let's say Monday through Saturday. Let they, let's say January through December. Would you say you're a grumbling person or would you say you're a grateful person? Okay. Two G words, grumbling and grateful. Okay. Is that a spectrum thing? We talked about this. Am I a love, lover and friend of the world? Am I a lover and friend of God? Is that a spectrum thing? You know, a fair question. Okay. Why is this topic important? William Wilberforce that's a big name, right? Ingratitude sickens the heart. Okay? I, I want to just pause for a second. Ingratitude sickens the heart. How? Chills and thickens ingratitude. Could you? There is a howling. Yeah. Chills and thickens the very life's blood of benevolence okay this is a pretty serious word I think your heart continue to be not grateful murmuring and complaining it sickens your heart it's a chronic sickness it's a chronic sickness how, how is it so it chills it makes your blood cold okay you become a cold-blooded type right sort of like reptile right cold, chills, and thickens the very life's blood of benevolence. You can't love others, nor you care about others if you are ungrateful. Did you know that? That's why it is serious, I think. William Wilberforce, pretty reputable name. William Law, one more. Okay, what is this grumbling and thankfulness about in your life? Okay, as thankfulness is an expression of acknowledgement of God's goodness of God towards you. Do you catch that? You're thankful if you, your heart is seeing God, His uh, dealing with you, you, you feel thankful. Your, uh, uh, it's good. It is about goodness of God in your life. Is God good in your life? So ripening and complaints are plain accusation of God's want 
of goodness towards you. You know what grumbling is? Basically, you're saying to God, accusing God, you're not good to me. That's what it is. So this is, this is no small thing. It's, it's no problem of your tongue. It's a deep-seated problem of your heart. You know who had this kind of problems? Israelites. Throughout 40 years. Read. For those of you who are reading uh, with the church, this week I happen to read, I mean, not I happens to read, we, are, we happen to be in the book of Numbers. I read from uh, Numbers 11 through 16, what, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So interesting. Six chapters, repetitiously, Israelites rebels against God. Rebel against God. Did you notice that for those, any of you read that this week? I hope you're reading it. You know who has a problem of complaining and murmuring and, uh, you know, this kind of heart? Israelites. Starting from Exodus, starting from exit of, uh, the, uh, you know, slavery, all the way to Canaan. But can I just remind you? You know what happened to the Israelites who complain all, all, all these years? They never made it to Canaan. They never made it to Canaan. That's what I noticed. Only uh, out of all the men who came out of Egypt, two men enter into Canaan, Joshua and Caleb, right? Who did not live by what they see and complained, but live by faith. Only two out of two million people. Okay, I want to start with that. And... Um, Numbers 11, we read, and Juan read, read it so well, because uh, it's such a long chapter. I don't know whether you know this chapter. I hope you read it this week. If you read it, this is so funny, so funny. I, was, I read it a couple times, a few times this week. This is so funny, if you could just pay attention to this, okay? Why is it funny? Oh, by the way, from 11 through chapter 16, s series of four rebellions of Israelites. I think it, it, it's intentional that God placed it there, right? First is rebellion about just hardship in the desert. Second is rebellion about quail, okay? We want meat. We want steak. We want steak. That's that they protest, okay? And third is about leadership. And fourth is about Korah, okay? Four rebellious rebellions. We're going to look at just first two. Numbers 11, fire from the Lord is the title. Okay, one, one through three. I'm going to read it one more time. Now people complained or murmured about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. In other words, Lord heard it. Okay? In fact, Lord hears everything. Okay? He even heard what Thomas complained. Yeah. Right? So, and when he heard them, look at this. His anger was aroused. How do you picture that? God's anger being aroused. I don't know. I try to make some sound effect. God's anger was aroused when people complained. Okay? Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Can you picture that? Okay? When the people cried out to Moses... That was their leader. He prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Tabera, because the fire from the Lord had burned among them, period. That's the first rebellion. Simple as that. People complained. The Lord heard it, and his anger rose, aroused, and the fire came down upon the people. You know what anger is? Anger is love in motion. Okay, what do you mean? Okay. God is angry. God's anger is his attribute that flows out of his love. I explained this before. Because what is anger? Let's say I have three children. I mean, I do have three children, right? And someone threatens them. Okay, someone come and try to beat them up for no reason. And should I not get angry at that person? Of course. Of course. What should, what should I try to do? Even if he's a big guy, I try, try to fight and destroy him. Someone who threatens the people that I care and love about. 
you get it? Anger is love in motion. And God is infinitely love. He loves you. What threatens your life? Sin threatens your life to destroy everything. Destroys your heart, destroys your marriage, destroys your family, destroys everything, every relationship. Okay? It's the sin that makes you complain and murmur. Right? So God's anger burned. That's anger. Love in motion. Okay? So that's the first rebellion. And we want to look at the, uh, jump right in. This is a fun story, quail story. Quail is a bird, okay? Bird. <clears throat> in Middle, uh, Middle East. Quail from the Lord story. I thought, you know, you know I, all, for the longest time, I thought it was uh, people wanted to have meat, so the Lord provided meat kind of story. But that's not it. If you could just pay attention to this carefully. Okay? Let's read it together. The rebel from them began to crave for other food. The rebel means people of different eth ethnicities among the Israelites. There were about two million Israelites in the desert after the Exodus, okay? And there were some different ethnicities who left Egypt among the Israelites, and probably a small number. They were saying, oh, we wish have some different meat, uh, different things. I wish we have some steak. I wish we could have some salad bar, okay? Some pe uh, people were uh, making this kind of comments. They were craving for food. And again, the Israelites started to wailing. Isn't that funny? They began to wail for food now, right? Said, if only we had meat to eat, okay? If only if we had meat to eat. We remember this fish. Now they, didn't they just say only meat? Now they say fish. If we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, also the cucumbers, melons, and leeks, and onions, and garlic, salad bar, right? So they want surf and turf and uh, 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 yeah, salad bar. But now the lost, we lost our appetite, and listen to, the, listen to this, we never see anything but this manna, lousy manna. Ah, do you see the attitude? Do you see what's happening here? Right? The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. And the people went around gathering it and they ground it in a hand mill or crushed it in a mortar, mortar. And they cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves. And it tasted like something like uh, with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. Okay, let me just explain something. See what's happening, okay? Numbers 11 is right after... God made a covenant with the Israelites. Before that, what happened was, they were in slavery for 430 years. God sent Moses because God had compassion upon his people. God wants to keep his promise. And by signs and wonders, power in the presence, God delivered them from the most powerful nation of that time. Okay, that's what happened. Egypt was the superpower of that time, and there's no way to get people out of, you know, from that nation. But God, in power, in signs and wonders, delivered them because He loved them, because He was covenant uh, in relationship with them. Okay? You know that. So they crossed the Red Sea. Remember that? How do you describe that? God parted the Red Sea, and they crossed the Red Sea. After killing all the firstborn of the uh, Egyptians. Do you remember? This is what they have experienced. This is the grace that they have experienced. They were saved from 430 years of slavery, which represents slavery from sin, right? They crossed the Red Sea, they came into the uh, uh, Sinai Desert, and just recently they made a covenant. God said, I'm gonna be your God. And you're going to be my people. In other words, I will take care of you. He promises the goodness. He promises the blessing. He promises everything. Right? So they went through this great redemption story. And the miracle after miracle. And then there is a um, presence of the Lord in glory. The pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. Which represent... It must have, it must have been spectacular if you if you could just picture it you need to picture this two million people moving in a desert how are they gonna move 
There is a pillar of fire and pillar of cloud leading, which represents the glory of God. And you're following that, and you're looking at that. You just experienced the Red Sea. You just experienced the great redemption. Now they're complaining about meat. That's what's happening. Okay, that's, that's the context. That's why this is funny, right? One, after, one rebellion after another, okay? Just few people, rebel, the ethnicity who left Egypt with the Israelites, they began to crave for food. I wish we have some steak, filet mignon, right? Salad bar, tomatoes and onions. And something like a bonfire, the Israelites started to wailing. Can you picture that? Everyone was wailing. What's wailing? They, they were crying with sound and tears. We want meat. Everybody. Can you picture that? How ridiculous that is. Right? Can you picture that? Can you imagine what's happening in the heart of God? We, he just saved them from slavery by signs and wonders. Cross, you parted the Red Sea. Made, just made, made a wedding covenant. I'm going to be your God. I'll take care of you till the end. I'll be good to you. Blessing upon them. The promise of the blessing. And it just spread. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt and at no cost. Also the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and crunch cucumbers and garlics. It's like kalbi and, you know, sangchu, right? They want everything. Now we lost, uh, lost our appetite and never see anything but manna. Have you lost your appetite for manna? What was manna right here? We, we never see anything but manna. Has manna becoming, become nothing to you? That's a dangerous place. Because that's what happened to them. What's manna? Okay, let me explain what manna is. Manna is a supernatural provision for two million people. Picture this. You're in the desert, okay? For those of you who never seen a Judean desert, I went to Jordan a couple years ago. It's not like Sahara, Sahara, North African desert, where there's all sand. This is basically wilderness. There is no life, okay? When we drive in Pennsylvania, everything is green. But when you drive in Jordan, everything is just, just the soil color, okay? It's wilderness. There's no life. And two million people, how are they supposed to survive for 40 years? Are they going to plant? Are they going to reap? Are they going to catch? There's nothing. How do you supposed to survive? So God provides supernaturally. Every morning, uh, just like the morning dew coming down, God rained down manna, heavenly manna, the bread from heaven. Right? Bread from heaven. All they had to do was get up, in, get up in the morning and gather them, collect them, okay? And then cook and eat. Supernatural means of God's grace, daily grace. And they were saying, only thing we got is lousy manna now. We never see anything but this manna. At night, it comes down, and it is like dew. Okay? That's a pretty, pretty scary place to go, right? This verse 10, next verse. Moses heard the people... And can you picture this? Every family wailing, every family wailing at the entrance of their tents. Can you Im imagine this? Okay, two million people, so I don't know how many tents. Okay, let's just picture ten, a uh, hundred tents this way, hundred tents this way, hundred every direction. And every tent, family come out to the entrance of the tent and they wailing for food. We want meat, we want meat. And they were crying and wailing. Can you picture that? Can you imagine what's happening in the heart of the heart of God? Right? And the Lord became exceedingly angry. Okay, he was angry. Okay? He was angry. And Moses troubled. When he asked the Lord, oh, okay, now this rest of the verse, 11 through 15, is about murmuring of Moses. 
okay, the leader, okay? Can you look at this? He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? Why have I done this, this please you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Can you imagine uh, someone talking to God like this, right? Did I give this birth, give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me if I've done, uh, found favor in your eyes. And do not let me face my own ruin. You know what this is? This is, this is the murmuring of Moses, the leader. And I was just meditating about this, and I noticed there is a lot of me and I. So I decided to read it this way, if I may. Instead of I or me, I'm going to place name Moses. And you listen, okay? This is one person's wailing. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant, Moses? What have Moses done to displease you that you put this burden of, of these people on Moses? Did Moses conceive all these people? Did Moses give them birth? Why do you tell Moses to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to their ancestors? Where can Moses get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us, uh, they, they kept wailing to Moses, give us meat to eat. Moses cannot carry all these people by myself, Moses. The burden is too heavy for Moses. If this is how you're going to treat Moses, please go ahead, kill Moses. If Moses found favor in your eyes, please do not let Moses face my own ruin. Do you, do you hear him? Do you hear him? This is, this is what murmuring is. It's all about you. Forgetting the greatness and goodness of God towards you. That's what murmuring is. That's why it is no small thing. I think God is such a long-suffering God here, slow to anger God. If I were God, Moses has been exterminated. Long time ago. I don't think he will finish these sentences. But God is such a slow, so slow in anger, unlike you or me. Do you notice that? If I was in the place of God, I don't think Moses would have had a chance. But he's so slow to anger, I think. Okay. What's God's response? Okay. If you could just look at this. God's response to Moses, God's response to people. Okay. This is really good if you could pay attention. Okay. Verse 16 says, Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of your, uh, Israel's uh, the elders. Wow, he's so patient. How am I going to carry all this burden? He said, instead of yelling at him, he said, I have prepared 70 people who's going to help you. Okay, bring them 70 elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people and have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I'll take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. In other words, I'm going to raise up 70 people to help you to lead this nation. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Now, that's to Moses. Okay? Now, his response to the people. Now, tell the people okay, who want meat, steak, and salad bar. Okay? Consecrate yourself in prepar preparation for tomorrow. Okay? Consecrate yourself because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act. Okay? You get ready, in other words. Consecrate yourself in preparation for tomorrow. When you will eat meat, the Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We're better off in Egypt. Right? This is what people wailed. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. Okay? That's what the Lord speaks to you. I'm going to give you meat. You want meat? I'm going to give to you. Now you're going to eat it. 
Okay? You will not eat it just for one day, two days, five days, ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month. Okay? Until it comes out of your nose. That's what it says, right? Lord speaking to his people. Until it comes out of your nose. And you loathe it because now here's a here's the key statement you have rejected you have despised the Lord who is among you and you have wailed before him saying why did you ever leave Egypt and then Moses goes on with his unbelief okay but Moses said here I am asking six, uh, here I am among 600,000 men on food and you say I'll give them meat to eat for a whole month okay a doubting statement would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them in other words you know God just made a promise and Moses is saying you think you could do that you think you do you could do that that's what Moses is doing and then Lord answers Moses so pa again so patiently is the Lord's arm too short is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I will say will come to, uh, true to you. I don't know whether you see what's happening here in this chapter. This is a great chapter because Israelites really symbolizes how people are. This symbolizes you. This symbolizes me. It really does, actually. We're no different. In fact, probably worse. Right? You see what's happening? Is the Lord's arm too short? How long is his arm, by the way? How long is it? How long is his arm? My arm is about two feet. How long is the Lord's arm? Is it about the length of Ma Ma uh, Sinai Desert? Is it as long as the Pacific Ocean? Is it as long as the galaxy how long is his arm is there any limitation to God of the universe you think God cannot provide meat for a whole month to you I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you okay and he does okay I jump a little bit verse 31 if you could just look at this carefully now wind went out from the Lord I think that's something to pay attention to wind came out from the Lord okay and drove quail in from the sea and it scared them to two cubit foot all around the camp as far as a day's walk in any direction okay let me explain this okay he drove quail by the wind and it's as deep as three feet okay I'm six feet so three feet okay that much is all meat around you Picture that, please. You have to picture this. Three feet of meat around you, up to here. You have to walk on meat. In any direction, okay, in day's walk, which means 15 miles this way, 15 miles this way, 15 miles this way, 15 miles this way. Okay, imagine that much meat around you. Can you, because I, I was picturing this, I, I thought it was scary. Scary. That much meat, quail meat, in any direction, because Lord heard them murmuring. All that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. Okay? They gather, right? No one gathered less than 10 homers. You know what homer is? One homer is one, what one donkey can carry. For those of you who have seen donkey, donkey can carry a lot. Okay, every house, 10 donkey full of meat they, they have gathered. Right? Then they spread them out all around the camp. Now, look at verse 33. But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people. And he struck them with severe plague. 
Therefore, the place was named uh, Kibroth Ta Ta Hatava because because they were buried the people who had craved for other food. Okay, from Kibroth Hatava, the people traveled to Hazaroth and stay there. And that's chapter eleven. Okay. You think we should learn the lesson by then, right? You know what the very next chapter is? Very next chapter is this. Okay? I'm just going to introduce. Very next chapter. Very next verse. Another rebellion. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses. Now, Moses was a leader, and Miriam and Aaron was brother and sister, the co-leaders. Okay? And they began to talk against the leader because the Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite, meaning... Moses made a boo-boo. He made a mistake. He married a Cushite wife. He should not have. Okay? But Moses married a Cushite wife, and his brother and sister is complaining. They're talking against Moses. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Do you hear the Spirit? Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked, hasn't he also spoken through us? And the next verse says, the Lord heard this. What can we learn from this chapter? Okay. I just thought uh, this was a great chapter in the Bible. You know what? This is not the only chapter. Read Exodus. Read Deuteronomy. Read Numbers. Throughout, from the beginning to the end. It's the character trait of the people. Okay? It's the character trait of the people who rebel against God all the time. Rebelling against God all the time. After the Exodus, after the great redemption, after crossing the Red Sea, after the making, making the covenant, after having the promise of blessing and goodness of God, people still rebel against God like this. Okay? What can we learn from this uh, chapter? What's grum grumbling and why is grumbling so destructive? I think the key is verse 20. Okay, let me just look at verse 20 right here. Okay, whole month, you're gonna, it's going to come out of your nose, and you will loathe it. And here's the key verse. What's, what's, uh, what's murmuring? What's complaining? You have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? What do you hear when they say this? It is so destructive because wailing and murmuring is to reject and despise the Lord. That's what, that's what it is. Despise the Lord. Despise the goodness of the Lord. God has delivered you out of slavery of sin and saved you. And now you're despising Him. That's what murmuring is. It's, it is about goodness. Right? His goodness and mercy who delivered Him, uh, delivered them out of Egypt from the slavery with signs and wonders. And you're basically saying, God... You're not good. You're not good. That's what murmuring is. Therefore, uh, grumbling is a rebellion against God and His goodness, like in personal rebellion. That's what it is. Secondly, why is it so destructive? It is still so destructive because God is among them. God is right there. God is standing there, and you're, you're just treating with contempt. Have you ever experienced something like that? I don't know whether you ever experienced. You are there. Let's say someone is saying about you right in front of your face, he's such a, such a jerk, right in front of, uh, of your face. He is among them, and they're treating him as if he's not there. Remember the story of golden calf? Same thing. Over and over and over again. You know why, you know why murmuring and complaining is such a destructive thing because he's there and you're treating him as if he's not there and just talking about it. He's not good. You're not good. It's no small thing, right? And thirdly, it is completely forgetting his greatness and grace. I don't need to re-explain this. You know, God just delivered them from the hand of Egyptians, right? And completely forgetting them. Now, just a little bit about Moses' unbelief, leader's uh, unbelief, and murmuring. His complaint and murmuring is to blame God, okay, emphatically blaming God. 
Therefore, grumbling is primarily uh, toward God himself. And we need to know this. Okay? Grumbling is primarily toward God, challenging and accusing his goodness and providence. We're going to be talking about providence today in our class. Providence means God is working and driving his people to his purpose with his goodness. That's what providence means. And basically, uh, complaining and murmuring means, I don't believe in providence. That's what it is. Okay? And then he disconnects and dissociate, dissociates himself from the rest of the people. Who are these people? I did not, I did not bore them. They're not my, my, my kids. Why do you tell me to carry them? And then you know what happens next? All you think about is yourself. Why did Moses get this? Why, why should Moses do this? How can Moses provide meat for these people? Why, 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 why? Me. And then eventually, this grumbling, kill me. Kill Moses. So self-destructive. Okay? No small thing. No small thing. I think that's why these stories are repeated in the scripture over and over again. For those of you know, uh, who read uh, the Old Testament, Job cursed the day of his birth. Remember that? Job it was so difficult, he cursed the day of his birth. Jeremiah bemoaned his conception and birth. Elijah, seeking death and depressed, when he was ch chased by Isabel, he said, kill me, kill me. And Moses, all these great men of the Old Testament, kill me, kill me. They had a problem heart. I want to just, uh, so what do we do? Redeeming heart of the gr uh, grumbling, okay? Grumbling and God's anger. What is grumbling? Grumbling is, is your anger. It really is. It's your, it's, your, it's your anger. There is man's anger, there's ang and then there is God's anger. We, we said anger is God's attribute. It flows out of his love and holiness, love in motion, right? Let me explain God's anger first. God is angry because he's love, and I explained that. Therefore, his anger and wrath begins in his holy love. Because he loves, he wants to protect the one he loves. He must restore what is broken by sin. Sin destroys everything, makes everyone broken. And God hates sin, that's why. Abhors sin and needs to destroy sin. Therefore, his anger is love in motion, in action. Anger is not sinful and it is his attribute. His anger attacks sin and destroys it, and that's our hope, because God loves us. He attacks sin and destroys sin, and that is our hope. His anger is preceded by slow anger. Unlike us, it's not explosive, sinful anger, but his slow anger, he waits, he's patient, and then in due time, he pours his wrath and angers and destroys sin. And his anger is sacrificial, and his anger brings freedom in your life. Okay? Man's anger, on the other hand, much simpler, okay? Let me start. Anger and wrath is love in motion. We talked about that. Now, problem with man's anger is this. Yet man's anger cannot be separated from sin because we are full of sin. It's in our DNA. That's, therefore, it's sinful anger. Just like Moses. Why did you do that to me? Right? Kill me. Man's anger cannot be separated from sin. It's just it's sinful anger. Therefore, it's self-focused, like Moses, selfish anger, and self-destructive. We saw that in, in Numbers 11. So what do we do? God loves us, and he wants to separate anger and murmuring from you. He does. How did he do that? The cross is God's simultaneous expression, perfect simultaneous expression of God's anger and God's love. Can you just stay with me just for a few more minutes? God poured his love on the cross. Because he loves you, his son hung on a cross and be cursed. And then he poured his wrath upon him because sin was placed upon him. You, now you understand that. 
It's the perfect simultaneous expression of God's love and God's wrath at the same time upon His Son. Okay? So, what do we do? On that cross, God placed our sin and anger upon Him and separated us and freed us by great exchange that took place on the cross. And that's what we say when we say we believe in Jesus. Okay? How does it, how does it, how does it work? Leviticus chapter 17, 11. Okay? It's about sacrifice and the blood. The life of the body is in its blood. I've given you the blood on the altar to purify you. Lamb's blood was poured. Now your sins are purified, atoned, forgiven. You understand that, right? To purify you, making you right with the Lord. Now you have a right relationship, peace, reconciliation with the Lord. Now here's a key sentence. It is the blood given in exchange for your life. Okay, that's how it works. That's, that's the cross. His death and blood is your life if you place your trust in Him. His wrath pour upon Him so that you will have freedom in your heart if you place your sin and your trust upon Him. That's the gospel. Last one, on the cross, Christ has broken chain of sin and anger through the blood of the Lamb. I think I'm going to skip this. Did you finish it? I think I'm going to do that next week. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. Is God redeeming your heart? Seriously, I want to ask you this question. Are you grumbling? Are you angry? Is God good to you? Is the question. Do you remember His great redemption in your life? Do you remember it? How about daily manna? Do you treasure it? Or has it become nothing? Oh, only thing I see is lousy manna. For you to breathe today. For you to have life today. Is that a small thing for you? May God pour grace upon your heart. Remember where you began. Remember where you began. If you don't see that, you'll become the most obnoxious, judgmental person. Most ridiculous person. Remember where you began. God just delivered you from that great nation of Egypt, slavery of sin, through the death of His Son, parted the Red Sea, and made a covenant with you. I'll be your God. I'm going to be faithful to you, even if you are not. I'm going to be faithful to you. And I'm going to bless you. You have the promise. You know, most of the rebelling in, in the Old Testament is against God or God's leaders. But they come together. It's mainly to, to, it is all to God. Basically, that's how the Bible teaches. All the rebellion and murmuring is about God and God's leaders. The Bible basically says it's one thing. You are complaining about, God's, uh, about God, His goodness. Is God good to you? I was going to explain about, uh, I'm going to show Shandalus List. I saw that movie this week. I saw that movie many, many years ago. It's from 1993, best picture of the, of the year. But I think it may be the, one of the best picture of all time, I think. Steven Spielberg about uh, Jews and he saved 1,100 lives. And the day before the war was over, right? People gather around because he had to flee because he was part of a Nazi party, flee. And they made a ring for him, ring that says, 
one life that you saved, you have saved the world. A day before the war was over. And then he drops the ring and he finds it and he begins to break down and basically say, starting saying, I could have saved more. You know how much money I have wasted in my life? You know, by the way, he's a businessman, profiteer and womanizer, but he spent everything that he had bought 1,100 Jews to save them. And at the end, all he cares about is one more soul. One more soul. It was just greatly inspiring. What do, you, what do you complain about? What do you complain about? If the Lord comes back tomorrow, what will matter to you? If the Lord comes back tomorrow, what's going to matter to you? Your kid's future? That's not going to matter. What will matter to you? Nothing will matter except your life before the Lord and the, and the people that you have influence to bring people to Christ. That's the only thing that's going to matter. I hope you get it. Let's pray.